So uh, this afternoon talking to uh, New Zealand's uh, Olympic gold medalist, uh, Michael Brake, who won an Olympic gold uh, in Tokyo in the, in the rowing eight. Um, so welcome, Michael. And, and do they still call it the 2020 Olympics or did it just get transferred? Thank, thanks, Alwyn. Yeah, at the, the event, there was still a bunch of 2020 uh, branding on, on everything in the event. I, I guess right. it was a bit, it was easier just to run with 2020 than 2021. Um, obviously, it happened in 2021, but uh, you, you get everything. People call it 2020, people call it 2021. You, you kind of know what they're talking about either way. So, Because mm, Brandon yeah, Curry um, had, had a tremendous performance this year in the uh, Ironman at St. George. Right. Um, and it was the 2021 World Ironman Champs, even though it was in 2022. And then there's another World Ironman Champs in Kona in October. Um, so, I mean, he's tough enough to go and have, a, have him another crack at it. But it, ha it has been a strange time. It's uh, definitely been odd. And it's, you know, it is it's nice to, to feel like things are starting to return to relative normality, I guess. Yeah. But, oh, I mean, you know, the sporting world is lucky that we managed to squeeze in these events in such a challenging time. And it's, you know, the fact that the naming is a bit weird will just, well, it will only add to the history of the events. Did the, so, so um, one of my organisations um, provided some help and sponsorship for an athlete called um, Ryan Sissons, who was... Um, heading I think towards the second Olympics and and actually 2019 and and um really 2020 he was in fabulous fabulous shape and uh he'd, he'd won uh, a very competitive triathlon in Australia had beaten the Kiwi Hayden Wild ultimately ended up with a bronze medal um and then because Ryan had been in the sport for quite a while uh, when it flipped over a year and, and it was postponed, he, he really just couldn't do it. Mm. And, um, did the rowing eight and the rowing squads pretty much stay the same, um, even though there was the delay? No, really, oh, it, really wow. did, it really didn't, no. Um, and look, I, I do remember watching, I, I followed Ryan getting into that 2019-2020 yeah. season and he, he, he really was on form. Um, yeah wasn't in contact with him, so didn't realise that that's what he went through. Um, yeah. But, geez, I mean, our story was, was, you know, everyone's got their own story as to how they got through those those years. Um, to answer your question, uh, absolutely not. I'd, I'd qualified the pair, so the two-man boat with another guy, yep. and we'd locked in our spots for Tokyo for 2020. Okay. Wow. Then it, it didn't go ahead. Um, slash got postponed and you know, everything was up in the air. No one knew what was going to happen. Uh, and then fast forward a year, we came back and we were in the men's eight with a, a crew that we'd never raced internationally with uh, going to the Olympics. So, I mean, it's, wow. it, it's not, the boats aren't that similar that you can just switch between. So it was quite a big change for us, for, you know, for, for Tom and I who are in the pair to go from targeting the pair event with all of the pair competition at the Olympic Games for yeah. what was three or four years we were targeting that to all of a sudden, you know, across the span of six months, we were retargeting and now going for a new event with a new field, um, with a new crew, working out everything to do with that, you know, working out the relationships with the people in the boat, working out how best to move the boat. You know, a, an eight has nine people in it with eight rows in the cocks and it weighs close to a ton versus a pair which with the people on the boat is maybe 200 kilos like there's a massive weight difference there so mm. you're rowing the boat differently you're collaborating differently because you've got 10 people in the team rather than three you you train slightly differently because you use slight it's a slightly faster race you're using a slightly different uh a slightly different part to your physiology to to move the boat like it was it was as far as changes within the sport go it was a full 180 for us Right. How how is that then then managed? Because uh, you know you 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 suddenly got what nine people in a in a in a set of coaches and officials in a room, 
uh, and and probably uh, a range of athletes going well at the very least we're a bit surprised. Yeah, <laughs> uh, this is, I mean that's an understatement. Yeah, um, that, I mean. <laughs> There's a couple of parts to it. Like we, the pair was still going to the Olympics. We'd qualified the spot for the pair. Uh, the eight had yet to be qualified, but put simply, heading into the 2021 trial period, the eight was performing the best out of any boat. Right. And so we, I guess, collectively the squad, we had an option and that we had two options. It was either send the pair, which has already qualified. So it's definitely got a spot at the games. Yeah but it's not going as well or do we or do we try and uh prioritize the eight and try and qualify it which was an extra hurdle to jump through and then go for that yeah. um and it was it was just such an odd place to be because the the idea of not not prioritizing a boat which is already guaranteed to be at the olympics yeah was just uh, so unusual i i don't think you'd find many cases where that's been done, but just the amount of buy-in, belief, and just with where we were at, all of the guys trusted in their guts that okay. going for the eight was was going to be the best option. So, I mean, it was a bit of a leap of faith, and and obviously it paid off. You never know in the moment. Yeah, easy to say in hindsight, but everyone just really believed that it was the best option, and with that full buy-in, that was it became the only option. Really, how, how important was someone like um, Hamish Bond? Uh, he he was the most influential in the boat, no doubt. Yeah, but something that was really cool about having Hamish in the boat was he was also the first to go cool. You know, I've done all these things. I've got all, I've got all this experience. I've got all of these ideas. But the only ideas I he, he would say, you know, he he didn't know how to move an eight. He had a he knew how to move a pair and he'd try he'd bring all his ideas to the table, but was always open to feedback. It was never a I've done this, it's worked, this is what we're going to do. It was more of a I think this will work, let's try it. And if it doesn't, then let's talk about why it didn't work and let's build an idea of what we need to move this boat. Um, yeah. so I mean he he had a great influence and in that he had these ideas and he was, you know, humble. Uh, he was, you know, he's, he's a humble guy. So he was very willing to to listen as well as talk. But probably the most beneficial part of having Hamish and the crew was that he was the only person who'd won an Olympic medal. And so yeah. he was the only person that knew what the markers and what the signs were that we were on track. Okay. So at any point, he could say the amount of training that we're doing is enough this is this is as much as i've done in the past physiologically we're going to be in a good place or we the signs of, you know the, the the training data our performance statistics that we're putting out in the eight are a really good indicator that we're on track yeah. and when someone who's got two olympic gold medals says we're on track it gives you a lot more confidence than just assuming that you might be on track but not actually knowing so so in an eight um is there is there a, a margin within which everyone kind of has to be the same um, in terms of uh, the, the 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 energy they can put out the um, the cardiovascular fitness and all of those sorts of things? Is is the boat only as good as the slowest person, or are there ways to kind of compensate around it? Everyone brings their own strengths and weaknesses. You've got like there's there's so many different parts of physiology that come into play you've got your strength which breaks down into raw power peak power um you've got your your fitness your physical fitness your endurance you've got people who can stay at a, a higher output for longer you've got people that can sustain a, a higher average output for longer so you, you've got all of these different things which people of different shapes and sizes bring different strengths to the table with to to tie that into your question I mean, it becomes a natural baseline and it's always beneficial to raise that natural baseline. But you've got to play to people's strengths. So if you've got a guy who's a guy, you know, if you've got a team member who's 
you know, your absolute powerhouse and you've got someone who's quite a bit weaker, well, you know, it's okay that the other person's a bit weaker. You'll try and lift that bottom line, but you're going to play to the strengths of the person who's, you know, you're going to, you're going to yeah. play to everyone's strengths. You're going to use the strong person's strength. You're going to tell them, right, you know, this is the part where we need power. You're going to lay it down. Um, so even though, you know, even though they always look as if they're going through the water at the same time and the, the rowers have to keep the same rate, someone can be putting in more or less effort. Oh, absolutely. And you could get, okay. I mean, geez, you could get a 50% variance and people will still be in time. You, you, there's, there's small things you can change, like you could change the stroke length. You, you've, you've correctly identified the most important thing is the timing. Yeah. And you can't get away with being out of time. It disrupts the boat too much. Not only um, does it take away from your top boat speed, but you'll also slow the boat down more in between each stroke. And so it's not just about adding speed, but being in time is also about making sure your speed stays up. Yeah. And there's there's so many different ways to stay in time. Like you could you could slow down the amount of um oh gosh, we get we're really getting into the technicalities. No, no, no. It's, well, it's interesting because you, you look at something like that and you think, well, they must be so uniform. And 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 it'd be incredibly hard to find eight people who are who are perfectly physiologically matched. You don't uh, find people who are perfectly physiologically matched. Yeah. Uh, you you mold it. Okay. And like, I mean, we when we were training in our peak, we were doing four to six hours a day. And six hours being a big day, but I'd say on average, we were doing at least four hours a day. And two and a half to four of that, depending on the day of the week, would be rowing. And you're not just going out there to get fit. Every session you do, sure there's a, a fitness benefit and a fitness element to it but every time you're rowing you're trying to sync everyone up better than you were yesterday right and that's technically syncing the crew up into a movement that is the best for the boat that's what you're always trying to do technically and then you break it down into the elements and you might work on this on that day and this on that day but or you're always heading towards being as in sync and moving as optimally as possible. So they have different positions, uh, and I, I, I'm by no means a rowing expert, um, but the one that comes up most often is, apart from the, 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 the cox, is um, the stroke. And, and so what's that role in, and where do they sit? So the strokes at depending on how you're looking at it, the front or the back of the boat. So for the rowers, the front of the boat is facing forward. Right. So if you're watching the boat moving in a direction, it's the person who's at the back of the boat. Yeah. So yeah, it's the person who doesn't have another rower in front of them, put it that way. And so everyone's watching this person. And the stroke is typically the person who's setting the rhythm. Yeah. So for our boat, we had Matt McDonald and stroke is one of our younger guys, which was not to take away from how strong and, and, and how good he was as a rower. He was one of our best. Uh, and he was stroking our boat. He was there because he set such a long, strong rhythm. So with him rowing with lots of length, length being a good yeah. thing in rowing, it drew out quite a nice long rhythm from the rest of the crew because he was the one up front setting that rhythm. Yeah. So there are different roles within the boat. And quite often we put people in a position where their strength would come out in that role. So okay. you have some of your, your stronger, more powerful, maybe even your more talkative guys in the middle of the boat where everyone can hear and feel the power. Uh, you've got people like Matt who are quite long and set a desirable rhythm in the front. And then uh, you often have some pretty tech savvy guys in the, in the bow of the boat where they can oversee everything. And there's a bit more feel up the bow of the boat as well. Right. And, and, the cocks, I mean, are they important? Um, do, Most do, important do, person in the boat, mate. And if Sam Bosworth <laughs> is ever with us, you better, you yeah. better shout me a beer afterwards. Uh, he's, he's, uh, the cocks is the most important person because they're arguably the only person in the boat that can have an influence over everyone at once. Right. And, you know, the coxswain's job is one of the basic jobs is steering. I'd say um, once the cox has been going for long enough, they get it. It just becomes second nature steering, just like driving a car. But um, the more important role is 
getting the crew aligned. So when you've got a crew like an eight, where there's eight people, and you know, as we've been talking about, um, you know, getting people on the same page and in sync, the cox is the person who is really the only person who can see everything at any point in time, yeah, and can give people feedback as they're rowing to get them where they need to be. So you know, real time, giving people positive feedback based on what they're doing to bring them in sync with the crew. Because I, I wouldn't imagine I wouldn't imagine they're allowed to be funny, like to just yell out <laughs> something ridiculous. Time and a place. <laughs> time and a place. It, it, I mean there's there's a, the occasion where it's appreciated, but you know, when the when the boys are uh, fifteen hundred meters deep and they're hanging on to try and win a race, cracking a joke is probably not going to be appreciated. No. Yeah. And and, and they're, they're, they're relatively uh small generally is was that the case yeah yeah so there's a there's a minimum weight limit for a cox it's okay. 55 kilos so you can't just strap out like a speaker to a baby or something <laughs> i mean you could you probably <laughs> you'd need to strap a speaker to a baby with enough weights to get them up to i say it's a 55 kilogram baby okay that's right there. Yeah. i was and just I trying to think I, that there was a different way <laughs> I don't think they'd steer very straight. That's probably one of the first issues you'll have is you'll be on the bank pretty soon. That's an issue as well. Yeah. yeah. Well, because, um, I mean, one of the neat things talking to um, Philippa uh, Baker was, uh, you know, that that um, she had this, you know, the lightweight uh, opportunity, um, which, which seemed to be um, a good thing in the sport as well. And there does seem to be a lot of, uh, ways into it is the community because so I so I, I taught for a while at Tauranga Boys and as I said to Philip I actually taught Mahi Drysdale in, in year 10 and and nothing was more surprising to to us as opposed to anywhere else that Mahi became this remarkable world champion because you know he was just a really lovely studious young person um, but I can't remember him charging around the sports fields or anything like that um, but I, I went uh, to so I coached rugby and and you know that can be stressful enough at a first of the world. But I went to a Mardi Cup at Carapuro and you just cut the tension with a knife. Um, and, and it was like you know principals weren't talking to each other, um, and and everything just seemed to be riding on some of these results. Um, how how does the community then come together? Is that through the clubs? Is that through the national mm. bodies and things like that, because there's extreme rivalry at that school level. <laughs> yeah, th there is a lot of rivalry. And I, I don't know, like, you get that in sport. I, I think the rowing it's possibly come about because there's not actually that many competitions. Yeah. And so when you come together, you're, you, know, you're, you train so much that you've got so much invested that you're here to win. Um, there's, you know, you're not competing every weekend and having and having a catch up afterwards with your with your opposition. Right. Um, that being said, the more time you spend in the sport, the more you you do start valuing getting to know the people that you're racing against, and the more you realise, you know, they're just the same as you. They're just in a different club. Um, you're right. I think it's the it's the club system where people, you know, where, where the rowing community starts really coming together and starts mixing a bit more. Yeah. Uh, so you, you identified correctly. The school rowing is quite a tense environment, um, <laughs> and it's it's kind of on the yeah. school athletes to meet each other. Like I, I, I've got, I got, I made some great mates while I was rowing at school. Yeah. Uh, but it was only because, you know, we'd actually go and have a chat with them at a regatta, and right. even then, initially, it was like they were like, "Well, what do you, what do you think you're doing?" Yeah. Um, but you, you have some chat, and then you. You get to know them once. You have some banter on the water, and then all of a sudden, you might go to a, you know, go to a party and have an orange juice with them or something. Whatever you do at school, I don't know. Yeah. Um, and then you you get to know them, and then you reach club, and everyone mixes and mingles, and and it becomes a lot more social. Cool. So you you went to some early or relatively early international regattas like juniors and things like that. Um, are, are they? formative experiences um are they good steps towards so you did uh, you also did rio um mm. that's quite young there as well yeah yeah um we talked to paul kingsman last week who went to his first commonwealth games at 15 
and wow. his first uh, Olympics at 17. And we see hey. how was Los Angeles? So a 17 year old swimmer. But without that foundational experience, he, you know, he won New Zealand's first uh, male medal in the swimming pool uh, ever. Uh, and, and he said, without that original experience, I probably wouldn't have been able to do it. So um, those experiences for you, uh, were they important? Were they fun? Interesting? Yeah. I mean, we, we kind of have a saying in this building that uh, you, your first Olympics is no, no one's expected to medal at their first Olympics. Yeah. And we actually, I mean, we kind of broke that expect. We, we broke that rule at Tokyo with quite a lot of young people getting an Olympic medal at their first Olympics. But you know, I, I think that rule still stands. Um, it was just a bit of an anomaly this year. But I get the reason why that message is there is because your first Olympics or you know pinnacle event for something slightly more relatable, your first Marty Cup, your first national champs it's going to be the biggest sporting event. It's probably going to be the biggest sporting event that you ever go to yeah. yet or to date. And so there's going to be a lot of stimulus and a lot going on. And so, you know, going there, there's going to be distraction. There might be too much tension. It's just, it becomes more of a learning experience than an ability to just rinse and repeat what you know how to do. Okay. And you know, for, for Rio, we, we spent, I think we had six or seven sessions run by the NZOC and they were kind of like preparation sessions, getting us mentally ready for what to expect. So that when yeah. we turned up, it wasn't all overwhelming and we weren't a bunch of, I think the average age of my crew was 21. There wasn't a bunch of 21 year olds at the, you know, at their first Olympic games running around going, what is all this? What's all, what's all this? And so we did these sessions that would have been 10 to 20 hours all up. And what's the first thing we do when we arrive? We get there, we're like, what is all this? What is all this? <laughs> and we completely lose our heads. And it took yeah. us, uh, we, we had an older experienced coach and you could just see him rolling his eyes and he's like, oh yeah. my God. Um, and I mean, we ended up getting sixth. So it wasn't yeah. a terrible result. Um, to be fair, it was sixth of seven crews, but the fact that we'd qualified was, was an achievement in itself. And when I look back now on Rio, it really is, Kind of like you said, it, and and kind of like um, you know the the the, the young swimmer, um, it was just a good experience. It was good to go there and experience it, and go, okay, this is what it's like. Um, this is what the step up for performance is. This is how people compose themselves. This is all of the media we should expect. Um, this is all of the extra noise, like the all the sponsors that come into the village, all of the messages that you get through social media um knowing that that was coming for tokyo yeah it allowed me before the olympics to choose what to block out what to engage in how to better compose myself and it just meant that there was less surprises cool. you weren't the only one that did silly things at, at that olympics um when we talked to ethan mitchell he um <laughs> you see the three of them were mucking around on bikes of all things Oh, it and, sounds about right. And, and uh, he bent it and broke his wrist the day before the team sprint. And ah, so, <laughs> gosh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> and to, have, to have that all strapped up, and they still meddled. Um, That's so, impressive. So you get to the final in, in Tokyo, and, and you've got sort of nine people sitting in a boat, um, and you know you're in great shape, but you know anything can happen. Um, when you're racing in a team situation like that mm. are you is, is it kind of like uh do your job or are you 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 taking in what's going on around you and, and, and supporting and 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 worrying i guess um about the other people and what they're doing and, and are you aware of the race you you're aware you're aware of the race uh for us and look, I, I would go as far as saying that in a sport like rowing where it's a race, the, the only thing you can focus on is yourself. Yeah. Uh, it might be different for a, a, a sport where you're playing against the team, you know, like football, basketball, whatever. But, it, you know, the Germans next to us are going to go from start to finish as fast as they're going to go. And there is nothing that we can do really that is going to change that 
So the approach that we took was very much, here's our jobs, we're going to do them. And it took a long time to learn exactly what our jobs were as individuals and as a crew. But going into racing, we very much just doubled down on what we knew how to do. Uh, we did get caught up. We did we did let our guard down in our heat. So in our first race at the Olympics, we did get a bit caught up in racing. I think it was the Americans were against and, and the British. And we got quite caught up in that. And we ended up getting second in our heat, uh, which for us was, based on our time, was was quite disappointing. But after that, we we came back and we reconvened as a team and we had a chat and we said, what went wrong? Are we just off the pace? What's, you know, why, why are we fourth fastest on times we thought we'd be up there at the top and the analysis came back as we just were not focusing on doing the job that we know we need to do we got caught up in racing the other crews in the race and we know that doesn't serve us so why did we do it and we're like uh we just got caught up in it so we said well that's an easy solution then cut that noise out stop focusing on the others Focus back on doing the jobs that we know we need to do to row as fast as we can from A to B. And I mean, we were lucky enough to have a middle race, a second race to test that. So we went back and we did our second race and it and it went quite well. And we focused on just doing our jobs. And then come the final, we said, look, we're just going to do what we did in that middle race, except we're going to lift the intensity up 1%. And that's all we're going to do we're going to do what we know how to do we're going to do our job we'll do it one percent better than yesterday and and let you know let the rest be history and that's exactly what happened so so in that situation because obviously commentators their job is to make make a race right and yeah they'll talk about tactics and things like that but is, is the primary tactic working out what to do in each part of the race to minimize the time it takes you um, I mean, like you, you're kind of getting into race plan here, and every crew's race plan will be different. Yeah. And our race plan was it was get out of the blocks, kind of fast. We weren't a very strong crew. We, I mean, we weren't. We definitely weren't weak, but we we weren't the fastest crew off the start. Yeah. You know, you know we talked about this boat earlier, which is one ton. You've got to get that from standing still to moving at mid 20s low 20 kilometers an hour like it's it's yeah, it takes a bit of manpower when you've only got eight guys moving that boat it takes a little bit to get it up to speed yeah and the crews that can get their boats up to speed the fastest will get their nose out in front first and and you really can make quite a bit of difference in the first minute of a race depending on how fast you can get your boat up to speed yeah anyway our race plan was really just just don't lose too much ground out of the start. It wasn't to try and be the the first. We tried that and we just didn't quite have it in us. So it was really just get out as fast as we can and then settle into a a a boat speed, settle into a rhythm and a boat speed that we know is the fastest that we can hold for two thousand meters. It's not a, a a pace which is just a far, just a bit faster than the Germans for the second five hundred. It's not a pace that you know, we will sprint at the end for it's a pace that we know is the fastest pace for us to get from A to B. And we're just going to sit on that and hold it for as long as we can, which in theory, if we've timed it right, should be the whole race. How much did you win by? Uh, half a second to a second, I think. It's almost a second. It's a, it's, it's a pretty small percentage, isn't it? I mean, it's a pretty pretty small percent. And, and if you, know, you look at our race, we didn't come out first. We were... Gosh, I think we were about three or four seats down at the one quarter mark, at the 500 meter mark. At the halfway mark, we pulled even. And then you see all the crews drop off, but but the crews, I mean, well, you see us start pulling away after the halfway mm-hmm. mark. And in reality, we haven't gone any faster. We've just held the same boat speed and everyone else has, has slowed down because they've been on a pace they haven't been able to hold. Yeah. And so, you know, that's our race plan shining through there. It's we're just holding our boat speed and we're just, we're on a pace and we have been for the last 500 metres that we know we can hold for the whole race. Whereas other people might have gone out a bit harder and hoped it would be enough to, to break the field. So, so what do you say to each other when you cross the finish line? 
Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, within reason, talking to young people. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if I can if I can repeat the exact words because there's a lot of emotion going through when yeah. you cross the line. But it's 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 a lot of disbelief almost because right. I mean, you you target this you ta you target winning the Olympics for for a long time. I think. I mean, I in my early days, I followed my nose through my rowing until 2012, where I had a bit of success as uh, in my last year at school. Managed to go overseas, and we won that. And I was like, "Oh, this could be a good thing." So, uh, you yeah, know, I'm going to go for the Olympics. And you know, if I'm going for the Olympics, I'm going there to try and win. And so, for 10 years, 2012 to 2022, that's that's and that's the target. And so you you cross the line, and you cross the line in first, and you know you can do it at the start of the race, but nothing's guaranteed. So then, when you actually do it, it's like, what the heck? Like, we've, yeah, yeah, yeah. We've, we've just done it. The, the the adrenaline, the endorphins. There's people, you know, the guys in the boat are yelling. The guys, you know, these are guys that you've been, you know, best mates with for ten years. They're slapping the water and shouting, throwing water up. They're slapping you on the back, and yeah, the pain. You, the, the pain after a rowing race is is usually pretty intense, but when you cross the line in first place, you don't even feel a thing. I tell you, yeah. the, the adrenaline. Nice. Uh, yeah. like, like like the Rod Dixon Steve Jones photo that we 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 talked about. Um, yeah, exactly like that. Yeah, like the photo. You, you you you. There's a special thing about winning that uh it seems to alleviate all of the pain at least temporarily. Yeah, uh, and it kicks in later on. But yeah, is it, it was a very special moment crossing the finish line. Very cool, and, and um, I'd imagine as a team, uh, you know, I've talked to athletes who've won Olympic golds, and they 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 tend to dip down a bit afterwards because they've built so much towards it. Um, but I, as a team, I guess you can keep each other up, and um, there's there's some strength in that. What do you mean by dip down? Um, I think uh, you can speak to a few people, uh, and and it's a bit like you know I've I've, I've finally done it, and um, then you know, it's it's a bit draining. Uh, you know, this is what I was uh, heading towards. This is what I was kind of living my life for, and goodness, what do I do now? Mm. So, um, well, and, and I think yeah. some of that's just human emotion and the level of adrenaline that you have to bring to a performance, and um, you know, at some stage you've you've got to take a deep breath. Mm. Part of yeah, I see what you're saying. So part of it's definitely energy related. That would be the, the short term. Mm. You, you finish the race and you're pretty drained because it it not only takes everything physically, but it does take everything mentally to focus that much that long. Sure. Um, a big part of coming off a pinnacle event and this, you know, the dip potentially that you that you're talking about here is, uh, yeah, you, as an athlete who focuses on achieving you know, this pinnacle event you spend so long focused on it and I guess working towards something that all of a sudden it's you know you're spending everything you do every day down to the time you go to bed down to what you're eating it's it's all towards this one thing and you know, nothing to do with achieving it or not it's the fact that this target this goal you're going towards is now no longer there right and you're not focused on that and you're not Everything you do it doesn't have the same purpose, or at least you, you know there's there's no there's no apparent purpose. Yeah. Uh, that's that's kind of where a lot of people come off, and I, I mean that's I would say that that's one of the biggest challenges of sport. Win or lose, everyone's going to come across. Everyone in sport will come across that challenge, and and even you know to the schoolies out there listening, for people that have been to a Mardi Cup or a national champs of any sporting code when you finish that national champs there's always this little down period where it's yeah. you know, you've, you've probably got your school studies to go back to but you, you're not training towards a pinnacle event and there's a, there's a natural slump that comes afterwards and look that's just sport you can acknowledge that it's coming that that always helps and maybe even setting a few goals for after sport helps quite a lot yeah um i, I that's what that's what i worked out after rio was you know, I, I needed something after sport or I needed something immediately after that event to go into and it was really helpful but look, even just acknowledging that it's coming is, is huge and just knowing look, I might feel like crap after this for a little while but that's to be expected and it's because I've been so focused for so long and had so much purpose for so long yeah 
So you've nearly also um, qualified as a civil engineer. Mm. Uh, nearly, nearly six papers to go. Is that is that? Yes, yeah, six. So I've got six to go of, of thirty-eight, and it's. Yeah. I think I yeah I, we were joking about this before. Yeah, I think I'm Auckland Uni. Uh, there, I think I'm their longest undergraduate student. I've been there for ten years now. Yeah. So yeah. what are, what are, what are, what is ten? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, well, when we spoke to Sir Brian Williams, um, because he became a lawyer, uh, you know, while he was an All Black, and then he would uh, sit his exams and, and you know when they were touring and, and and things like that, and pretty remarkable story. He wasn't getting paid as an All Black though, he said. So it was it was actually quite a necessity um, mm. at that time. Um, but what 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 do you, do you have career hopes in engineering? Uh, something yep. that sort of work I'd like to do. Yep. So I mean, look, look, one benefit of taking ten years to do a degree is that, you know, I've realised this is actually something I want to do. Yeah. Um, it's it is it is important to have something on the side of sport because mm -hmm. one day sport's going to end for everyone that's in it, and having something not just to fall back on, but that creates options for after sport is pretty important. Yeah. And the systems, excuse me, the systems that are in place now, particularly within high performance sport, uh, they encourage and support the athletes to go and do other things and get ready for life after sport. Um, you know, some of the other, some of the national sporting organizations, rugby is particularly good. They, they take it a step further and support in other ways, but there is quite a strong push now for athletes, particularly professional athletes, to think about what they're doing after sport. And look, I, I the plan for me is to use my engineering degree. Um, it's already, you know, that having that interest and having that background has already gotten gotten my foot in the door with a number of opportunities, um, which is great. But mm -hmm. uh, it's just even just having something to do as an athlete. Half of being an athlete is resting and recovering and, and having downtime. And so you're going to have downtime. Why not fill it with something productive? Yeah, I, 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 as an educator, I, I don't think that's a bad plan. Um, so so I'd, I'd certainly advocate for that. Um, are you, so, so you're still in the sport? Uh, I'm still involved in ways, but I have... I have... I have Somewhat retired, yeah. Okay. Um, during, I mean, and it's a obviously, I don't want you to answer specifically, um, but for someone like yourself who, you know, has effectively been a, a full time athlete for 10 years, that, that would be fair, wouldn't it? About, um, have you been well looked, you know, well looked after again without, without sort of, you know, picking at things? Like it mm. probably isn't perfect, but would you consider that? This has been a, a, a well-supported journey. In the early days, so th there has been a lot of positive change towards the end of my 10 years. In the early days, the support was very, it was there, but it was, you get what you look for. So it was basically, you know, there was a lot of, here are all of your options. It's up to you if you want to use them. And yeah. they're available and they're free, but, you know, bring a bit of proactivity to the table. Um, whereas now it's there's quite a bit more structure to it and there's a lot more support for new athletes coming in that don't know what they don't know and might need to have their hand held through the process of, look, this is what you can get out of this, this is what you can get out of this, but there is a lot of support. Uh, I definitely haven't left sport with any um, hard feelings about the treatment, which is an awesome place to be. No hard yeah. feelings about what I did or didn't achieve, um, you know, it's 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 quite a privileged place to be to be able to come back into the Royal New Zealand building where I am now, and not feel any feel no resentment, but yeah. you know also not feel <laughs> like I need to get back out and train on the water again, which was quite a nice place to be. Cool, it's and you, you haven't you have had to take shopping bags down the street and go through rubbish bins. You've been sort of well <laughs> <laughs> um, the pay and sport. It's pay in sports always an interesting one because you know how much value do the how much monetary value do athletes actually bring mm -hmm. um, in order to to warrant significant payments. Um, 
I think that it's it's heading in the right direction. And I was always fortunate fortunate enough with my results that I was always paid fairly, right. um, very very fairly. Even I would say um, it's a, a lot of the pay is results based. And look, sport, you know, it, it kind of just makes sense. Um, you know, you, you you wouldn't get paid in a job where you weren't performing. Oh, totally. Yeah. So. Well, it's, it, is, it is a challenging space, and, and I do think yeah. it's it's heading in the right direction. It's improving, and look, there's this base salaries coming in to to look after younger, newer athletes or athletes that might not have had the opportunity or chance to perform yet. Yeah. Um, because high performance sport is also heading in a direction where if you want to be the best, you've got to commit full time. And if you're committing full time, how are you going to work? And if you want to try and work, how are you going to have the energy to, to perform and compete? So it it does require a high level of commitment from from people that want to do well but it's i mean it's always going to be challenging um yeah. and it's going to depend on the sport as well there's some sports that are better funded than others uh but you know back to myself um i've always been i've always been paid m- more than fairly i would say pretty, pretty much the same as steve curry um <laughs> <laughs> maybe a tad less um <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe um, a little bit less. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe. Cool. So you were you were going to um show us around a little bit and um, yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. So that would be amazing. Um, so, I've really appreciated you sort of answering the the questions. Um, I I, I did have um down here and and, and you but you probably explain it because yeah, I read that you've you know got five red coats, uh, and and so what that that sort of idiosyncrasy is, and um I did wonder if. You know they they have lightweight rowing whether they couldn't have heavyweight rowing you know so you got a whole lot of people out there who are like they have to be 200 kilograms at least and that sort of thing you know or reverse coxswains where you've got all these 50 kilogram fellas and your cox is like <laughs> 150 kgs they've they've introduced these uh these fun events at nationals where they where they do set interesting rules on them so I yeah. mean, they they introduced one that was a, a love double. So you have to be doing it with your partner. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I mean, <laughs> I mean they, they've they've introduced a whole, I mean sibling skulls as well. So you've got to do it with a yeah. with a brother or a sister. Yeah. Um, maybe maybe upper weight limit or reverse coxswain is you know yeah. maybe you're onto something. Yeah, I think uh, because boat would probably be like that. So you'd, uh, yeah, that, that would be an interesting one, especially if they've got kind of short limbs. Yeah, they, they do do a coxswain race, which is usually quite entertaining, where they, they put the coxswains to the test and they'll put all the coxswains in a boat and have a rower coxing them, and it's an absolute mess. But uh, it's it's a good laugh for the rowers that can get back at their coxswains and say, oh, it's not as easy as it looks, is it? So, uh, so that's cool. Cool. So show us around. Thank you so much. which has a whole lot of the trophies stored here in the Royal New Zealand trophy cabinet. Um, this is often the room that crews will come in and you know, they might have like a, a chocolate milk or something afterwards and everyone will sit around and, and talk about um, how the row went, talk about you know, ideas that they might have to improve. Um, bit of sporting memorabilia here. You've got a Beijing row suit, a London one, world champions across the years which is quite cool. It's quite a nod to all of the success that the building's had over the... Just cut out for the moment. Oh, yeah, keep it, keep it a bit closer. Did you guys hear from the 1972 uh, guys who, who, who still around say, thank goodness for what you've done? So people yeah. can... <laughs> Quite a few of them have reached out. Yeah, it's actually been really cool connecting to them. Yeah. Um, they have reached out, which has been awesome. It's... Yeah, I mean, it's just it's just cool to it's not it's not taking you know taking the the focus off them. It's it's really it's adding to the story of the New Zealand Day. It's cool that we could you know that nineteen seventy two and now two thousand and twenty slash two thousand twenty one um, can be associated together and mm. you know just be part of that history of New Zealand rowing in the men's act. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so right here, this is oh, turn my camera around if we can. Just a second. So this is the entrance way. You've got um, this is updated usually each year. So this is all of the Olympic 
results on the wall um, or all of the medals. Entrance way to rowing, a couple of the older Olympic results, which was really cool. Um, and then back a step further. Oh. So there's your 72 eight here. Yeah. Um, what's that? That's 25, 1925. Oh, wow. And then, yeah, Darcy Hadfield. Uh, he was first rowing medalist for New Zealand. Um, office through there. I'm not sure how well the reception is going to go. So we'll just see how we get on. All of the boats are downstairs. So you've got six bays of boats down there, but there is definitely no reception down there. Yeah. Um, and that come through. <laughs> so we got full gym. Nice. And then this is where the erg room is. So all of the rowing machines wall in there so that we can heat it up uh, for when we go over to Europe or Japan when uh -huh. it's hot. And then look at that. Beautiful. I went out there um, earlier this year for the kayaking nationals, and um, yeah, yeah. but then watched the 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 paddle off um, between uh, Lisa Carrington and, and Amy. Yeah, yeah, and I gee, I thought it was brutal, um, and you know, a thousand people went out just to just to watch three minutes of racing. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, it was tough. Were you there? The somewhat crazy thing about rowing and kayaking is that you know, you'll get people who <laughs> come down to watch not even the race, just a portion of the race. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you turn up to watch a race and it's not like watching a, a football game where you where you can sit there and you, you're in the stands and you watch the whole 80 minutes of it. You turn up and you get to see the last minute. <laughs> so, well, there are people there are people who go to the Tour de France uh, to watch the peloton go past and um i my son and i had a tremendous privilege a few years ago to go to the world cycling champs in richmond virginia and yep. um the neat thing about that is it's laps uh and and so you, you i think it's 13 laps 260k um and so you're watching this whole race develop um over time and and you know you've got your screens and you know what's going on um and you pick a good part of the of the course as well, but yeah, you're right. Um, yeah, it was, I think just being there. Hey, um, thanks, thanks so much. So, so are you basically full time study now, or are you working? Or um, so I'm actually heading over to Europe on Saturday just to follow the rowing team around. I told myself that when I wrapped up my rowing, I'd I'd go and enjoy it on the other side of the on the other side of the fence. So follow the team around uh, and then finish up at the Com game. So my partner's Michaela Blyde and the women's seven. So I'll, I'll go and watch her play, hopefully. She's still going to make the, the team for the Com games, but go and watch her play uh, at the Com games and then come on back and get stuck into some um, some work. Yeah. Right. Nice. Hey, congratulations on, on um, and you probably heard it, Thousand times now. It sounds a bit like in the US when a soldier and everyone goes, "Thanks for your service." But um, yeah. um, you know, winning an Olympic gold is something else. And I've told this story before, where my oldest son got to stay a weekend with Sir Peter Snell uh, in, in oh, Dallas, awesome. and it was pretty awesome. And on the last evening, Sir Peter took him to his office and showed him the medals, and and they said, "You know, I'm I'm now in my seventies, and I've had a remarkable academic career." But these things still have um, amazing meaning to me. So it was cool. Yeah, no, that's cool. And, he's, and Peter's an absolute legend, obviously. Um, but yeah. hey, thanks for that. And, and thanks for the opportunity to, to talk as well. That's okay. So I'll put it up um, in the next day or so. And um, we'll get out to our people and to other schools. And um, you're welcome, obviously, to share it and go from there. Awesome. Cheers, Alan. Thank you so much. Thanks, mate. Bye. Bye. Yeah.